Well, I'm very honoured to be giving this talk at UT 2021. And while we can't meet in person, I'm very glad for underwater technology and especially the subsea fibre optic cables that allow us to talk to each other even in these times. And I'm also glad for our shared passion about the ocean and technology. And today I'm going to be talking about reimagining seabed imaging. So when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, one of the things that he said is that the earth is pretty and blue. And the reason for this is 70% of the surface of our planet is covered by the ocean. And we have a pretty good understanding of the shape of our planet from the peak of Mount Everest all the way down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And that's because our satellites can detect small differences in Earth's gravitational field to estimate the shape of its terrain down to a resolution of five kilometers. So just to put that into perspective, this is the city of Tokyo where we would all like to have been gathered today. And you can see that at five kilometers resolution, we can barely tell the difference between it and any other city in the world. In fact, to recognize the features that make even our biggest cities recognizable, we really need to have a resolution of 100 meters or better, at which only 10% of the seafloor has been mapped. But if we zoom in to a spatial scale that's more familiar with our daily lives, so this is the University of Tokyo campus with the IIS on the left-hand side there, you can see that even at 100 meters resolution, we can't recognize the parks and the buildings that surround us every day. To recognize those, we really need to have a resolution of 10 meters or better, at which only 0.05% of the seafloor has been mapped. So this is the shape of our planet to the best of our knowledge. And this is a 50 times higher resolution map of the planet next door, located 55 million kilometers away. And this is a 500 times higher resolution map of the moon, located 380,000 kilometers away. And the reason that we have better maps of the moon and of Mars than we do of our own planet is because of this, the ocean. So to make high resolution observations of the seafloor, we need to go out to sea on ships and dive down using submersibles like the ROV Hyperdolphin you see being prepared here. And when we do dive down, we can witness some of the most spectacular scenes that exist on our planet, like this hydrothermal vent where we have hot fluids coming gushing out of the seafloor to form these spectacular structures that support diverse chemosynthetic ecosystems we had no idea existed 45 years ago. But while our technologies are great for getting close and interacting with these systems, sometimes what we really need to do is just take a step back and look at the big picture. And while it might sound simple enough, it's one of the biggest challenges we face in marine research today, because water is an environment that limits the reach of our sensors and the endurance of our platforms. And the only way we can scale our capabilities is by increasing the autonomy of the platforms and sensors we send out to sea. So this video shows some of the AUVs I've been involved with developing, and these are all capable of hovering within a few meters of the seafloor so that they can take images of it. And when you're close enough to take images, you only see a very small footprint in each image you take. So these vehicles need to move around over large distances to cover large areas. So this video here shows us deploying tuna sand of the University of Tokyo off the coast of Okinawa to survey some shallow water coral reef. And using systems like this, we can generate high resolution, three dimensional reconstructions of the seafloor, where we can explore all of the spatial scales from millimeters to the entire region that's been mapped by the AUV. Now the images you're seeing here were taken from an altitude of two meters where each image frame covers roughly the area of a tabletop. And to get an idea of the scales we're talking about, this is the Bingham Copper Mine in Utah, which is a geological feature that's similar to what we might be interested in mapping on the seafloor. And the area we map in an hour with an AUV operating from an altitude of two meters roughly covers this yellow square in the car park you see there. And mapping that whole car park would take us a day the green box would take a month, the blue box would take a year, and mapping the entire mine would take 12 years of continuous operation. 
So to achieve scale relevance, our group's been looking at high altitude mapping, where instead of mapping from two meters height off the seafloor, we're operating at altitudes of close to 10 meters. And this does two things. First, we can image a much larger region in each frame, more like a large room than a table. And because we are at a safer altitude, the vehicles can also operate much faster and we can achieve a 50 fold increase in the areas that we can survey. And of course, this comes at the cost of the resolution of the data we collect. So it's a trade off. And to map regions, we use various trajectories for our vehicles. So we can cover very long lines, sparse grids, or perform dense grid surveys. Another area that's being developed that helps us collect more data from the ocean is the development of low energy platforms. And these platforms can cover a much larger distance than a conventional AUV. And what this video shows is a very good example of a low energy propulsion system. So this is an incredibly efficient swimming fish. And I know that this is a very efficient swimming fish because I also know that this fish is in fact dead. And what's happening here is that the flow from the cylinders upstream from the fish are producing vortices. And the stiffness of the fish's body is so perfectly tuned to those frequencies that it resonates. And this passive property alone is enough for the fish to swim forwards and propel itself. And we've seen examples of this kind of concept being used in robotics. So for surface waves, we've seen wave gliders that will use the undulations to generate lift and propel themselves forwards. And in the center there, you see a soft robotic squid that is using mechanical resonance. So it's vibrating its body and that's hitting the resonant peak of its soft membrane and using that it's able to propel itself extremely efficiently in the water. And then on the right there you see a Lagrangian float which drifts passively on underwater currents to cover long distances without the need for any kind of sideways self-propulsion. And we're seeing ultra-long endurance AUVs, such as on the right we have the National Oceanography Centre of the UK's Boaty McBoatface that can cover not hundreds but thousands of kilometres during its multi-week dives. And then below that we see a ultra-long endurance Lagrangian imaging float which we've called Floaty McFloatface and this also has multi-week endurance. And these imaging systems and long endurance vehicles allow us to collect more and more data but collecting data is only ever part of the story. And recently I heard that 90% of all the data that exists has been gathered in the past three years, which is an amazing statistic. But what we need isn't data, it's information and insight about the ocean. And I'm pretty certain that we haven't generated 90% of knowledge in the past three years. So as we see our machines get better and better at gathering more data, we also need to think about what we're going to do with all of this data. And there is a saying that a picture speaks a thousand words, and that is fantastic until we start building automated machines that take hundreds of thousands of pictures every day. So the real challenge we face is turning these hundreds of thousands of pictures into simple statements of understanding. So if we look at the flow of information during marine surveys with Argo floats and gliders, these systems go out to sea and every few days they come up to the surface and they transmit their measurements to shore via satellite. And this works because the data they collect consists of vertical profiles of temperature or salinity and they can send scientifically useful information in just a few hundred kilobytes. And it takes just 10 to 20 minutes over the bandwidths available through global satellite networks to do this. And because we can send data from remote locations with low latency the data collection process and understanding that gets generated is almost synchronized. And we have this continuous process of building insight from thousands of systems that are always out in the field and we can react adaptively to events that occur in the field. So from this perspective, for these kinds of systems, we can say that the ocean is already online. Now, when we talk about imaging, it starts off in a similar way in that we send platforms out to get data. But when they've done that and they come to the surface, we cannot send their data over satellites as it's simply too big. 
So it would take us eight hours to send a single compressed image of the seafloor. And take into account the fact that we are collecting not one image of the seafloor, but about 20,000 per dive, it's unfeasible to transmit all of this data. It would take almost 20 years after a mission that lasts 20 hours. So we need to recover these platforms and bring them to shore in order to process their data. And the vast majority of this data is processed offline in the comfort of people's homes and offices because the analysis usually takes many months or even years to complete. And the consequence of this is that the discoveries we make also take place on land, many months or years after the observations were made, at which point the people, the ships and the robots that gather the data are nowhere near the place where the discovery was made anymore, and we can't do anything more about it. So we call this the problem of latency of information, and it causes us to make trade-offs because we essentially have different windows we can view the ocean through. One where we can see more of the ocean, but only at a very low resolution, and one where we get very high resolution, but we only see a small area. We don't really know which one of these we should be using and where. So another thing that causes us to make tra trade-offs is the sheer time it takes to process image data. And this is still largely a manual task, where for most applications we can't really justify the effort needed to manually analyse the data from a single dive. So if you take a look at the images in the centre there, you can see that drawing outlines around objects that are interesting in an image takes about three minutes to do per image. And if you multiply that by 20,000 images, that would take a person 120 working days per dive. And these systems go and gather data um, in expeditions that consist of several dives. So because the workflows we use in marine imaging assume this kind of discrete process of going somewhere, gathering data, coming back to process it before repeating the whole cycle again, we end up in this situation where the more data we gather, the harder it is for us to keep up and make discoveries while they are still relevant. And if we had 100 times as many robots collecting data, we would end up waiting 100 times longer to make those discoveries. So what we really need to do is start thinking about how we can move away from this mentality of discrete sequences of gathering data, processing data, and start thinking about how we can build information environments that allow us to gather, process, and learn from data in a continuous way without relying on discrete start and end points so that we can start making building insight from imagery a more scalable and continuous process. So a couple of years ago, a group of us went on an expedition on the Schmidt Ocean Institute's FALCOR um, called Adaptive Robotics. And this was to test out how to approach this concept of expedition level autonomy. So this is a photo that I took on the aft deck of the Falcor during our expedition. There's nothing special about what you see here. There's a few different types of underwater vehicle. Each one is equipped with a different type of sensor. And it's very common for us to have diverse platforms that do different things and collect different types of information. It's also common that we operate these in complex environments that we don't know much about, which is normally why we go to these places in the first place. Another common theme is we don't control everything that affects our operations. We often operate in limited time windows due to weather, crew availability, maintenance schedules, all these things affect what we can do. And when you combine all these factors together, it's very easy to get things wrong. So the question we were looking at during this expedition was how can we make use of the information we generate during the expedition to help us make better decisions in the field? So to build rapid understanding of our observations, we started looking at a type of robotic intelligence, so machine intelligence, that uses something called unsupervised learning. So normally we can automate data interpretation using neural networks. But the problem is they require a large amount of data that needs to be first interpreted by humans to generalize and become usable. And that kind of training data normally just doesn't exist and it's too expensive to generate. The unsupervised autoencoder can solve this problem. It still needs a large amount of training data, but it doesn't require any human input. And the way it works is similar to a zip file, where we have a pair of deep learning neural networks, where the first network basically acts as a zip function. 
compressing an image as well as it possibly can into a few dimensions. And the second does the exact inverse of the operation where it takes that compressed space and tries to regenerate the original image as best as it possibly can. And if the reconstructed image looks like the original input, we can be sure that the zipped up feature space contains all of the information we care about in the image. And the good thing is that it doesn't require any human input for this to work. So since the features that distinguish habitats on the seafloor are often larger than the footprint of a single image and often have patterns with depth, what we've done is we've augmented learning so that if a particular pattern isn't particularly strong, but it is recurring in images that are taken that are close to each other or are taken at similar depths, the machine learning will start to prioritize those patterns and recognize these are more important than others. And once the machine learning has this understanding of the images, we can start to ask it questions. For example, can it group into clusters similar looking images? Or can it rank images by their similarity to each other? Or can it identify the few images that are most representative of our entire data set? So we deployed robotic systems and this artificial intelligence at Hydrates Ridge, which is a field located about 100 kilometers off the coast of Oregon at a depth of 800 meters. And this is the site of gas hydrate fields, but also the site of the Ocean Observatories Initiative, which is one of the largest seafloor cable observatories. And it's also host to diverse marine ecology. And this shows an example of some of the data we collected. So this was data we collected with our high altitude mapping AUV A2000F from the University of Tokyo. And it was able to map an area that's about 12 hectares in just under 20 hours. And to give you an idea of the sense of scale, on the right hand side there is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So you can see it's a pretty substantial area that we were able to map. And if we zoom in, you can start to make out the different features of this map. So you can see here the subsea infrastructure, the cable that joins it all together, and you start to understand just how heterogeneous this environment really is. So those are these white bacterial mats where we have increased levels of animal activity. And when we give that data to an algorithm, it can organize every single one of the images by the other images that it looks similar to. So what you see on the right hand side there is every single image that was taken during that dive, so it's about 20,000 images, has been put into a cluster. And if we look at some representative images of those clusters, we can see that the blue corresponds to sandy areas, the green corresponds to rocky areas, the pink corresponds to bacterial mats, and the dark red corresponds to these cables. And if you look at the left hand side, you can start to build a very rapid understanding of the nature of the seafloor in these regions. So we have a sandy area that surrounds a rocky outcrop, which has in the center of it bacterial mats, and there's the cable array being distributed all around it. And the top left shows you how the machine learning algorithms understand this environment to be, so how similar each image is to each other. We can also ask the algorithm questions. So this is an image that is interesting, it's a cable, and what we can do is ask us to show us all, rank all of the images in order of their similarity to that query image. So it's almost like a search engine, where it returns all of the images that look like that, and also a map of the region. So we've generated a map of cables, or a map of infrastructure, or a map of bacterial mats. And all of these operations take milliseconds. So we can start to build a very rapid understanding of these sites. And what we did in this situation was we identified the sites that were low risk, but interesting. So areas where there's not much infrastructure or cables, but there is a lot of biological life. And that's where we sent our low flying AUV tuna sand in order to make more detailed observations. So this is an example of how we are able to use information generated during the expedition to make the expedition better while we are still out sea and really focus our observation efforts with tuna sand in the places that are most interesting and are going to advance science the most. And we can do that without sacrificing the big picture view. 
So this is a map of the Cable Observatory and we're able to locate all of the different instruments on this location. So we can see where all of the Cable Observatory cables are, the different instruments, the locations of the mid-range and the small nodes around that build up this cabled observatory. We can also use this information to help guide ROV pilots. So this is an example of us using maps that were generated just a few days before, mapped by the AUV, and also the results of the unsupervised clustering to identify places that are interesting that we want the ROV to go to. So they can pilot the ROV looking at these maps in real time to get exactly to the place that we're interested in. And in this case, we were able to successfully navigate an ROV to these gas hydrate plumes where it could use uh, in situ laser Raman sensor to measure the composition of gases that were coming out of here in an extremely targeted way. So one of the things that we are interested in understanding is how well the machine understanding lines up with human values of what we find interesting. And on the left hand side, that is a map of the things that humans see in those images. So humans have labeled 20,000 images taking about three weeks and we can see the distribution of rocks, sand, carbonates, bacteria, and that's all the things that we care about. And if you look at the right hand side, that's what a machine was able to label after about eight hours of training and the labeling itself takes a few seconds. So there's a lot more labels generated and there are a lot of similarities between the human and the machine map, but it's not an exact mapping. So there were several classes that were generated by the machine learning, and we don't exactly know which one of those it matches up to for the things that are of interest to humans. So one of the things that we've discovered is if we use the representative images, so on the top left hand side, what you see there is the machine's understanding of what images in this area look like, we can ask it for a representative sample. So something that will describe all of the type, different types of observations that were made. And what we found is if a human attaches labels to these images, we're talking tens of images to hundreds of images, we can achieve very good alignment between the machine and the human understanding. So instead of having humans labeling thousands, if not tens of thousands of randomly selected images for weeks, to teach a robots or a machine to see the things that we like, we can get it to very quickly adjust the boundaries of its classification and clustering to match our boundaries by just providing it with a small number of representative images. And that's what this figure shows here. So the top left is the human generated data that shows the distributions of things we care about. And the bottom left shows the machine's understanding after we've provided just 40 labels, which took a human two minutes to do. And you can see if we provide 100 labels, it looks more and more like the human uh, generated data. And with 100 labels, we've only spent five minutes of a human's time uh, telling the machine how to align its boundaries with the things that we're interested in. And you can see if we provide more and more labels, the results get slightly better, but after about 100, it's already converged on a solution that we are happy with, but also it's an amount of effort that is realistic for people to do when they go out to see and collect a data set. It's very feasible for someone to spend five minutes or 30 minutes labeling a few images that are suggested to them by a machine. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the things that we can do and some of the ways we can improve the understanding of images in expedition relevant timeframes and get machines to understand images effectively. And getting machines to understand what they see is a really critical feature of advancing our technology and getting robots to do more complex tasks. This figure is inspired by Hans Moverek's artificial intelligence capability landscape. And what it shows is a landscape where the waterline represents the things that we can do with robotic systems today. So we can do bathymetric surveys, water column chemistry surveys, 3D visual mapping surveys. And the things that are beyond the waterline are the research areas where 
you would expect to find in a symposium like uh, underwater technology, people would be talking about the best ways to do underwater manipulation, docking, vehicle, multi-vehicle coordination, and data interpretation. All of these tasks require the robots to understand the data that they're collecting in real time. And the higher up you go on this landscape, the harder and harder the tasks get. What's really high up in those are things like cinematography where you require a robot to understand how to artistically show an object that might be interesting to people and also things like maintenance scheduling and expedition planning and the stuff that's really high up there are all things where solving the information environment alone won't get us there and although there's been huge progress in autonomy we're still not at a point where we can automate an entire expedition so what you see in this slide on the top right is a photo of that expedition where you see our four robots and you see about 40 people. There's always a lot more people than there are robots out in the field and that's because expeditions are very complicated. On the left hand side that's a simple decision tree um, for a very short one week expedition and what it shows is the green regions are when we actually get to deploy a robot and dive versus the red which is when there's some circumstance that we means we can't dive on that day and the important thing here is none of the reasons why we can't dive relates to the data or our robots or our sensors normally it's things that are outside of our direct control things like weather transit times um, availability of, of people and staff and on the bottom right, here are some examples of some of the reasons why we haven't, haven't been able to deploy a robot or delayed our deployments. So we've had situations where we've had whales in the way of the site or situations where a seamount we thought was there just isn't there anymore when we go to reobserve it. We get lots of people who get stuck in immigration or vehicles stuck in customs. That can cause problems. We get people forgetting things. Who brought the box with the O-rings? So these are all things that happen in a day-to-day -day basis on these expeditions. We have things like forgetfulness, forgetting to recharge the batteries or wanting to have breakfast before we go and do these deployments. So these are all very human issues. But at the same time, humans going out of expeditions is part of our story. Because when you go out on these expeditions, that is where you build friendships where you inspire each other. Going out on these expeditions is fun and exciting. So there's always this human element that when we talk about automation, we mustn't forget. And when we look at that photo with 40 people on the ship, all of those people are there because they enjoy being there and they want to be there. So to finish, I want to show you a video which you've probably already seen very recently. So this is the Mars Perseverance landing. And I watched this video with my wife and my three children and we were silent for the entire duration of the video and we cheered at the exact moment that the NASA team cheered when they learnt that the rover had landed successfully on the surface of Mars. The next morning my four-year-old son built out of Lego a small Mars rover robot and my daughters asked me what the rover was going to do on Mars whether there are any aliens for it to see and whether they could do their school holiday projects on this landing. And it really makes you realise that exploration isn't just about data, information and building insights, but it's also about inspiring people, making them want to know more and want to be involved in your missions. So my question for us and the underwater technology community is what is our mission? What is it that we can do that entire families will sit around a television and watch together what is our story that will inspire people and make them care more about the ocean and underwater technology thank you very much for your attention thank you very much Blair. any questions or comments Please write down in the chat. Okay, so there's a question on what type of machine is used for neural network calculations. 
uh, whether it's a high performance computer. Um, the answer is not particularly high performance. It's a normal workstation. And we are looking at um, doing some of these calculations on embedded computer systems as well. So the thing that takes a lot of computational power is to train these systems, but a trained system encoding image spaces is actually a very cheap operation that can be done uh, on, on mobile devices as well. When do I think the entire seafloor will be photographed? Well, I, I think I've done that calculation uh, in the past um, and I can't remember the exact, uh, the exact, the exact number, but it was um, of the order of several millions of years if we had thousands of robots out uh, collecting those photos. So I think the more, the more realistic target is when we see projects like Gebco Oceans um, that are looking to map the entire seafloor at a higher resolution of about 100 meters um, as opposed to five kilometers, is can we use that to identify the places that are really important, where we really need to send our robots to photograph them? So rather than trying to treat the ocean as uniform and all requiring the same amount of effort, we need to identify the places that are important to us and focus our efforts just in those places. And then there's also a, a comment um, about the talk. So thank you. Sorry about the uh, technical problems, but hopefully <laughs> it was uh, still okay. <laughs>